This is Members' Business Debate on Motion 10364 in the name of Monica Lennon on incinerators, public health and planning in Scotland. And this debate will be concluded without any question being put. Would those members who wish to speak in the debate please press the request to speak buttons and I call on Monica Lennon to open the debate up to seven minutes, please, Ms Lennon. Thank you, Presiding Officer. I'd like to thank members who have signed my motion and I remind the Chamber that I am a member of the Royal Town Planning Institute as listed in my register of interest and a hello to, to visitors who are in the, the public gallery. Planning decisions about the use of land and buildings can make or break a community and the role of the planning system has huge potential to enhance communities through the creation of high quality, sustainable places that support the health and well-being of current and future generations. However, this potential to protect and transform places cannot be realised without communities. Planning should be a process in which communities are active participants, not passive consumers of something which is done to them, rather than by them and for them. In too many cases, our planning system continues to fail on this front. The best example I can use to illustrate the important role of community in planning comes from my experience of Whitehill, a neighbourhood in Hamilton, which I previously represented as a councillor and which I'm still proud to represent today as an MSP for Central Scotland. Whitehill is a place where people look out for each other. Residents value green space and have fought hard for resources to help reduce health inequalities. But it's also a community that has faced adversity. It recently lost its library due to austerity and it is certainly in no mood to gain an incinerator. A proposal for an energy from waste incinerator at Whitehill first emerged in 2013. And together with local councillors, we all worked to make sure that people were aware of the proposal and how they could have their say. Working under the banner of HERAG, residents in Whitehill, Burnbank, as well as from nearby Bodwell and Uddingston, and more recently from Blantyre, joined forces, giving up many Saturday mornings and weeknights. In May 2014, the planning application was refused by South Lancashire Council's planning committee. The campaigners were jubilant. The developer was defiant. An appeal was submitted to the Scottish Government in August 2014. Twelve months later, a decision was released by the Scottish Government confirming that the incinerator was allowed to go ahead on the basis of national needs. Now, my constituents played by the rules of a plan-led system, but at the end of the day, the Scottish Government decided it knew better. Boosted by the appeal victory, the developer didn't stop there. No, a second planning application was submitted, this time for a bigger and bolder form of incinerator, and it's still being looked at by the council. In so many ways, the experience of the Whitehill incinerator is a story about the power imbalance which exists at the heart of the planning system. Pursued by an Isle of Man-based applicant, the proposed incinerator didn't comply with the development plan. It didn't have the support of local residents or a single local councillor of any party. And it didn't comply with the Scottish Government's own guidelines for incinerators. Incinerators, according to Scottish planning policy, should be at least 250 metres away from homes and other sensitive buildings. This one will almost be cheek by jowl with homes along Whistlebury Crescent and a travelling people's site. To be clear, the approved proposal and the new one breach the development plan and Scottish planning policy. Surely this makes a mockery of a plan-led system, which we've had in Scotland for a long time, and undermines the participation of local residents who engaged in the process in good faith. It's become a battle similar to the incinerator proposed by Shore Energy in the Carnborough and Shawhead area, which Elaine Smith has fiercely campaigned against for years alongside Monkland's residents against pyrolysis plant campaigners. And at Fulton McGregor now as a constituency member, it's also actively campaigning against. Across Scotland, local decisions on incinerators are being overturned on appeal despite genuine issues about particles, air quality, health impact, traffic volume and compatibility with residential areas being left inadequately addressed by the Scottish Government and its agencies. 
Because if a 250 metre buffer zone isn't really necessary and the Minister is prepared to allow incinerators to be built a matter of metres from people's homes and residential caravans, why hasn't the Scottish Government updated Scottish planning policy to reflect this? Alternatively, if the Minister is standing by the current Scottish planning policy, can he explain later on in the debate why the Scottish Government was prepared to compromise the safety and immunity of my constituents? Because I believe they deserve to know. Last year, a Sunday Herald investigation by journalist Rob Edwards ran under the headline Ash Heap Nation and examined fears over the proliferation of super incinerators across Scotland. In the report, Dr Richard Dixon from Friends of the Earth Scotland warned the Scottish Government to stop this rush to incineration before it is too late. The Government must be clearer with communities over the health risks posed by incineration if they are to push ahead with super incinerators to meet national targets on waste, because this cannot come at the expense of the health and well-being of some of our most deprived communities. Updated guidance must be published to identify the impact of incineration on pollution and human health, and better consideration given to the location of development sites if we're going to continue with this policy framework. To, to wind up, presiding officer, the decision to allow the Whitehill incinerator came down to an interpretation of national priority over local need and local circumstance. The remedy for the communities affected by the Whitehill incinerator lies in the hands of the Minister for Local Government and Housing. He could right a wrong rather than sticking to the position of his predecessor. He could, at the stroke of a pen, use the powers available to the Scottish Government to withdraw planning permission for the Whitehill incinerator. To do so would respect the views of four-year-old Lily Grace McGee. In her handwritten objection letter, she voiced her concern for the wildlife who live on the site and for her friends who use Batmuir Woods. She is worried, like me, that the incinerator will harm the health of the community. Planning should be driving up standards in placemaking and improving the public health of the nation. Incinerators in built-up areas that violate development plans put that at risk. Presiding officer, my plea to the Scottish Government is this. Please don't turn us into an ash heap nation. Thanks. We now move to the open debate. Uh, speeches of up to four minutes, generally, please. And I call Richard Lyle to be followed by Maurice Golden. The debate um, today, um, can I be begin this afternoon by thanking Monica Lennon for bringing this important issue to the Chamber? And I welcome the opportunity to speak in a debate which the subject carries significant relevance to my Uddingston and Belsall constituency. The motion before us in Ms Lennon's uh, uh, name mentions Scotland's Zero Waste Plan and it's to that end I wish to begin my remarks in the Chamber. I think it's right to recognise the importance of the strategy leadership it offers on waste management. In its ministerial foreword at the time, our excellent former Cabinet Secretary Richard Lockhead rightly recognised that under the Scottish Government there had been a dramatic cut in the amount of waste we throw away in landfill sites and recycling rates had soared with figure the Scottish Government has supported local authorities in their efforts to increase recycling rates. Moving on from a record in waste management recycling, Deputy uh, Presiding Officer, I wish to focus on what I believe is the heart of this motion to be about and what about, and that is about incinerators as a form of waste management and the associated impacts that they have on public health in Scotland. As many members are aware, my constituency is currently faced with the prospect of being hemmed in but on both sides by incinerators. From Whistleblower site in Whitehill in my constituency to Canberra play, uh, Plains and the neighbouring Coatbridge and Chryston constituency, of which I'm sure Philip McGregor will mention in the chamber when he makes his remarks later in this debate. The question is, what does this mean for my constituents? And the answer is quite clear. It means a proposal for a 1995 flu stack at the Whistleblower site dominating the local skyline. This site, as already has been mentioned, is very close to houses in Whitehill, Hamilton. The very real implications of a risk posed by fly ash, which poses a, a risk to groundwater and by association potential impact on public health through the harmful byproducts and emissions. 
For my constituents, it reminds them of Steelers' wheel. But instead of clowns to the left of them and jokers to the right, it's incinerators to the left of them and incinerators to the right of them. It's un utterly unacceptable. And I, along with constituents, will oppose these proposals. I am, however, always heartened by the strength of response by those in our communities impacted by incinerators. They have mobilised, as already has been said, and formed action groups, namely uh, MIRAP, Monklands Residents Against Paralysis Plant, and HERAG, the Hamilton Energy Recovery Action Group. I am also delighted to work with HERAG and to inform local people of the impact which White Hill and other areas face regarding these proposals. All involved in these organisations have freely given their time and resources to campaign passionately and not only to inform the public, but to share important information that often goes unnoticed. Their work is testament to the power of local people to campaign issues important to them, and I consider it to be important. By paying tribute to them all, to the work that we have to do, to, we have to look. And the point has been made quite uh, forcibly by Monica Lennon, and I have to say I join with her in asking the government, as I have done over the last uh, year or so, to join and look at the proposal that's been put in. It's a site in my constituency which is too near White Hill, has to be opposed, and I, uh, as far as I'm concerned, I also ask the Minister to look at it and to exercise his pen in regards to this proposal and also to uh, look at it closely. And I'm more than happy to uh, join and I look forward to hearing from the other cont contributions in, the, in this debate in regards to this matter. Thank you, President Officer. I call Morris Golden to be followed by Elaine Smith. Uh, thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer, and I'd like to uh, thank uh, Monica Lennon for bringing this debate uh, to Parliament today. I think and I recognise that while there are uh, local issues in relation to this uh, particular motion, I think that we need to set the general context of incineration in order to properly review what is happening at White Hill. And the first part in doing that is to establish why we should not incinerate in the first place. It's widely established that the best thing we could do with our resources, our, our waste as it's commonly termed, is to prevent it in the first place, to then prepare for reuse, to recycle, and then finally, uh, depending on which waste hierarchy you're using, to either incinerate or landfill. In fact, there is an argument for saying that it's better to landfill rather than to incinerate because then there is at least potential to recover those valuable resources at some point in the future. Uh, indeed, if any incineration is going on, it should always be combined with heat and electricity production as a bare minimum. And the reason for this is that we do not want to be in a situation, which we're currently in, whereby we are digging up resources from halfway around the world, transporting those materials to be put together, often uh, under some of the worst and most horrendous labor conditions, literally on the planet, to then be shipped back to Europe or indeed to Scotland and the United Kingdom, whereby the product is then used for a very short time period or sometimes not at all before it's uh, tossed in the trash and then uh, ludicrously burnt, having spent all that time designing that product uh, in the first place. Uh, the other reason is that, on a more practical basis, local authorities are often signing up for up to 25 years of a contract with, uh, with waste uh, companies in order to burn waste. Now, the Scottish Government knows that they have set those same local authorities with targets to recycle waste. Now, clearly, we can't both recycle and burn the same product but uh, clearly for some local authorities, they think that's possible. I'd like to hear their feedback on that. So there's a risk of not making our targets. And the state of play in Scotland is increasingly worrying. A 12-fold increase in incineration is planned by the Scottish Government over the next five years. There is 
since 2011, there has been a two-thirds increase in burning things in incineration, and this is very uh, uh, worrying for all of us concerned. I would urge, and I know that the Greens support us in this, uh, on a moratorium on new uh, incineration facilities that would stop uh, the incinerator uh, uh, in, for the subject of this motion. But indeed, there will be those that have uh, passed the point of no return. And of course, um, we need to live with the consequences of that. When I spoke to my colleagues in Europe, they said the one piece of advice they would give Scotland is do not build these plants because they have an overcapacity. Um, if people or local authorities or others really want to burn stuff, then they can duly export uh, that um, stuff to Europe where they will happily burn it for you. The answer is not to do that here. And I welcome the motion which Monica Lennon put forward. And I hope that the, the government will properly look at uh, ending these incinerators once and for all. I call Elaine Smith to be followed by Mark Ruskell. Thank you, President Officer. Can I thank Monica Lennon for bringing forward this important debate? I first became aware of issues around incineration, pyrolysis and energy from waste in 2009, when an application was submitted for a pyrolysis plant at the site in Canbro, as mentioned by Monica Lennon. The communities of Canbro, Sightside and Showhead were understandably extremely worried about the proposed development and they organised uh, the Monklands Residents Against Pyrolysis Plant MRAP campaign. And they're still campaigning against this incinerator and I too am pleased that Fulton McGregor is also supporting them in their campaign. President officer, I attended the first public meeting about this to hear the concerns. And I then spoke at numerous public events in support of my constituents. Local families felt strongly that the construction and operation of this pyrolysis incinerator as a private business venture would have a negative impact on quality of life for the many families who live in that large residential area adjacent to the site and indeed for families throughout the wider area. Um, indeed, the Coatbridge area has actually more than sufficient waste reduction facilities and it's also suffered from landfill sites over the years. At the time of the original application, I stated I was not prepared to stand by and allow my area to become the waste capital of Scotland and a dumping ground for everybody else's waste. On the issue then, the council refused planning permission and I believe that should have been the end of the matter. Well, as Monica Lennon said in their opening, uh, the constituents for MRAP were pleased about that. And ministers have been keen over the years to tell us that planning decisions should be taken at the local level. However, in this case, it went to a reporter. The reporters then held the initial meeting when the snow of 2010 stopped local people from being able to attend, so, so much for local involvement. I presented then on behalf of the community at a hearing over several days. Um, that was a fun way to spend my February recess on that occasion. And the outcome of that should have been against the development, but it was not. The council then took the matter to court, unusually, but unfortunately, they didn't win and indeed the Scottish Government refused to use its powers to step in and stop this. And that's unfortunate, given that the Government answer to my many questions over the years on this particular facility has been that decisions should be taken locally. Well, I think they should. Maggie Proctor, a leading campaigner, said at the time, we cannot and will not accept that this incinerator is necessary for Monklands. And she went on to say of the company, their only risk is financial. They're asking us to risk so much more. Maggie Proctor was and indeed is deeply concerned about the health implications of uh, this type of incineration and rightly so. Living in Lanarkshire means that you're far more likely to be admitted to hospital with COPD than the UK average and pollutants are known to aggravate both, uh, pollutants are known to ag aggravate that kind of respiratory condition as well as uh, asthma. The report has stated that there would be no significant impacts on human health, but with such emerging technology, I fail to see how they could have been so sure. Pyrolysis systems have not been around long enough to testify to their safety, and in actual fact, no plant can be fail safe. No one locally wanted to take that kind of risk with schools and nurseries within a short distance and hundreds of family homes next to the site. Indeed, a previous accident at a German plant led to the pyrolysis gas leaking into the atmosphere and residents had to be evacuated and taken to hospital for checks. Friends of the Earth criticise these plants as it's difficult to know what will be emitted when information actually comes from the companies themselves. 
So I would suggest it is environmentally better to focus on recycling and other forms of waste prevention, since any type of incineration can undermine recycling efforts, a point made by uh, Maurice Golden. And after all, incinerators do require a continuous supply of waste to make money. In any government waste strategy, environmental justice must be paramount. And worryingly, research has shown that more deprived communities uh, bear a disproportionate burden of negative environmental impacts, such as industrial pollution. So, like uh, Monica Lennon, can I ask that the government update their public health information on these technologies as soon as possible? However, the biggest problem with all this is a lack of democratic accountability in the decisions, particularly when council decisions are overturned by government. In closing, President Oscar, can I just say, increasing community engagement in the planning process is of paramount importance. Listening to the real concerns of local people must be a priority, particularly with incinerator proposals, and stopping the apparent presumption in favour of big business over communities is vital. Once again, can I thank Monica Lennon. I call Mark Ruskell to be followed by Claire Hawkey. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer, and can I thank Monica Lennon for bringing forward this important debate this evening. Um, and I'd also like to raise uh, um, an example from my own region uh, on a former open cast coal mine at Westfield near King Lassie in Fife. Um, Westfield is a uh, vast site which has lain empty since the last coal was extracted in 1998. The land has gone to seed and the pits have filled up with toxic water. So it's no surprise that the local community was initially enthusiastic to hear of plans lodged in 2016 to redevelop the site into a renewable energy and recycling park. The master plan for redeveloping the site includes uh, solar farms, glass houses for horticulture, business units, a recycling center, public access works. But at the heart of the master plan is a 20 megawatt energy recovery facility, or as the general public would more commonly understand it, an incinerator. The plans for this incinerator are buried in a 156-page planning statement, uh, but include the provision for burning around 200,000 tonnes of waste a year, with an estimated 64 lorries a day visiting the site along narrow rural roads. Constituents approached me just a few weeks before the master plan was due to be considered by Fife Council, with many of them having only just realized that the plans included an incinerator. And I heard of community council meetings with the developer presenting plans of redeveloped locks, local business opportunities, and thousands of jobs, but with not one single mention of the incinerator that was at the heart of the plans. So, you know, people tell me that they feel duped and let down by the planning process. There has been no honest or open discussion about the need for an incinerator only confusing language and greenwashed promises. Um, the application um, itself used the failure to meet recycling targets as a justification for building further incineration facilities. And I'd just like to quote from the, the planning application. It stated, uh, and this is its words, not only was the 2013 target missed by some margin, the rate of increase has effectively stagnated, whilst the zero waste recycling targets are laudable, and remain the Scottish Government's stated position, the reality is that they are very unlikely to be achieved. It then goes on to extrapolate how much waste will be needed to be incinerated in Scotland once a landfill ban is in place and if we're only reaching 50% recycling targets. Now, you know, bear in mind that this application in principle was approved by Fife Council in October last year. Uh, is the Scottish Government really happy with recycling targets we're struggling to meet being interpreted as a need to burn more waste rather than improve recycling rates? Um, I've also got uh, concerns about uh, a glaring loophole in the 2014 uh, waste regulations, um, which include an exemption, and I'll, and I'll read this out again, um, which states that material with no prospect of being recycled due to severe and or prolonged market downturn or collapse um, effectively uh, could then be uh, incinerated. Now, given that China stopped taking 24 different kinds of materials, including many plastics, at the start of this year, I would suggest it's only a matter of time before this vague clause is enacted. And clearly, developers are relying on these loopholes um, in order to make the case to planning authorities for their applications. So it increasingly seems uh, that these planning decisions are being decided on not by government policy, um, but by speculative application, uh, projections by private developers looking to cash in. Um, if planning policy is to be truly effective and give local communities a fair say in developments, then it must be led by robust, evidence-led government policy, free from loopholes, 
that could see our best zero waste intentions go up in smoke. I call Claire Hockey to be followed by Graeme Simpson. Uh, first of all, I would like to thank Monica Lennon for bringing this uh, debate to the Chamber today. Being less than a mile outside my constituency, I wish to centre my speech upon my long-standing opposition to the proposed White Hill incinerator that is situated just over the border in Richard Lyles, Uddingston and Bells Hill constituency. The site may well be in another member's constituency. However, harmful emissions and pollution do not respect boundaries and nor will associated health risks be confined to one single constituency. It's therefore entirely understandable and indeed welcome that politicians from different political parties and across various constituencies have united with local communities to oppose the facility in Whitehill. Presiding officer, I'd like to put on record my appreciation for the grassroots work undertaken by Blantyre and halfway community councils in my constituency both of whom have been instrumental in the campaign against this incinerator. As I highlighted in a parliamentary motion last August, Blantyre Community Council alone amassed over 3,400 letters of objection, as well as a 2,200 signature petition against the proposal after conducting an extensive campaign in the area over last summer. All of this was achieved, I'm told, with the Community Council chat on the door of almost every home in Blantyre and I was pleased to have been able to assist with their efforts. Given the projected impact radius by pot potentially harmful emissions, an estimated six miles, halfway community council objected to the proposal too, and in doing so embarked upon a similar exercise to that of their Blantyre counterparts. Halfway community council also visited the vast majority of homes in the Cambus Lang East Ward, which is no mean feat, and they secured a further 600 objections. In total, with the work of the other community organisations and the Hamilton Energy Recovery Action Group, over 6,000 objections have been lodged with South Lanarkshire Council. With, certainly. Maurice Golden. Uh, I thank the member and I respect the work that the member has carried out in Blantyre with respect to the uh, proposition there. I wonder if the member can give uh, her opinion on whether she thinks there should be any of these facilities built in Scotland. Claire Hockey. I certainly don't want them built in Scotland if Mr Golden is asking me my opinion. Absolutely. I think I've been quite clear in, in my speech. Um, without the actions of the community, the developer Clean Power Properties would not have faced anywhere near the level of opposition as they have over the last few years. So everyone involved must be congratulated for their drive and their commitment. During my response to this application, I raised 12 separate points of objection. And my objections included the proximity of the proposal to residential dwellings, and Monica Lennon has already mentioned this. The development would be situated approximately 50 metres from a residential site that is home to local show people, not travelling people, but show people. Um, that there are several food and drink manufacturers and producers near to the proposed facility who may be adversely affected by emissions, and particularly Duns on Glasgow Road in my constituency. And regarding the specific technologies the plant would utilise, the White Hill incinerators proposed to use pyloresis and gasification, which according to Friends of the Earth would rely on feedstock, which is rich in paper, kitchen and garden waste. However, these are widely recycled by local authorities already, and as such, it begs the question as to why this incinerator is needed in, in Whitehill at all. My constituents should be in no doubt. I'm fully opposed to this proposal, and indeed a similar one in Monklands, which I've also lodged an objection to earlier this month. And I wish those campaigning against this development well. Presiding officer, our planning system certainly plays a crucial role in the outcome of future developments and ensuring that communities are properly engaged in the process. With the sizeable number of objections to the Monklands and Whitehill incinerators, it's clear that local people are engaged in the process in this instance. Presiding officer, I agree with what many of the previous speakers have said, and in my opinion, the Whitehill incinerator and similar proposals are not the answer to reducing landfill or to waste management. Richard Lyle's constituents don't want it, Fulton McGregor's constituents don't want it, and my constituents certainly don't want it. South Lanarkshire Council's planning Close, committee please. is set to rule on the application in due course and I sincerely hope the hard work of Halfway and Blantyre Community Councils and that of the other community campaigns pays off. Graeme Simpson followed by David Stewart. 
Thank you. Um, can I also thank Monica Lennon for securing this uh, very, very important debate. Um, apart from dealing with Brexit, I've been doing little else but thinking about planning recently. Uh, Monica Lennon and myself sit on the Local Government and Communities Committee, which is dealing, de dealing with the seriously flawed, I have to say, planning bill. Uh, this debate raises a number of important matters that are part of our considerations. First, the role of planning. The bill says nothing about that. Readers are left with no idea what it's for. What it is, uh, should be about, is about creating great places and protecting great places. Places that enhance the health and well-being of residents. Now, I held a members debate on the importance of the Green Belt last week that dealt with that very issue. I needn't go over that ground again, but those that know me know my passion for protecting Scotland's environment. The second issue is the way people feel remote from the decision-making process. And there's no doubt that communities feel excluded from the planning system. The local issue brought up by Monica Lennon today highlights that. Clean power properties were met with opposition to their original incinerator plans at the site of the former Craighead School back in 2013. And the campaign was launched against the proposals. You've heard that South Lanarkshire Council refused the application, but a decision was taken by the Scottish Government reporter in 2015 to return, to overturn that. The Scottish Government thought they knew best. Now, Clean Power Properties then came back with a revised application for something even bigger. It's yet to be considered, but I'm on the side of the community in this, just like the other speakers in this debate. This brings me on to the next issue, where the power to make decisions should lie. This is a huge issue at the heart of the planning bill. Is it right that a democratic decision taken locally can be overturned? Is it right that ministers can call in applications and overturn decisions? I asked about this uh, at the committee last week and a witness told me that ministers were democratically accountable and only called in major applications, which is not true. There is little trust in the system. Um, we're looking at how to better front load the planning bill at the moment, uh, but it fails on that front. The final issue is how we deal with waste. Now, Maurice Golden is more of an expert on that than I am, um, and we've called for a moratorium on new incinerators. I'm glad to hear Claire Hawhey back that, but we do need to deal with our waste somehow. We can't go on dumping it willy-nilly in landfill sites. They're also controversial. I played a part, Deputy Presiding Officer, you may well recall it, in getting Glasgow's massive landfill site on the edge of East Kilbride shut down to further waste some time ago. It sat in what was Greenbelt land. In my view, it was responsible for polluting a local wildlife reserve. It should never have been there, but if memory serves me right, it was granted originally on appeal. Local politicians were overruled. There's a pattern here, isn't there? So from South Lanarkshire to North Lanarkshire, we've got plans for incinerators. What we don't want is for our area, the area we represent, to become incinerator central. We need to trust the local politicians. Thank you. Well done, David. I call David Stewart to be followed by Fulton McGregor. So in Kud, I also congratulate Monica Lennon in securing this afternoon's debate and also thank her for her excellent speech which reflected her first class knowledge of planning and of course her local community. Discussions about town planning can often be framed in the negative. When we hear about planning decisions, it's usually because someone somewhere disagrees with it. For those seeking to obtain permission or object to an application, the complex process can be long and confusing. But of course, town and country planning plays a crucial role in the flourishing of our communities. The system allows, or should allow, for serious thought as to how land can be used in the long-term interest of Scottish citizens. So planning decisions, therefore, have the power to impact 
intimately on individuals' lives. So the stakes and the pressure are great. And our aspirations for town planning are also high. We want it to deliver more sustainable places that can encourage economic growth, but not damage the environment. We want it to deliver places that enhance and embrace Scotland's beautiful natural assets, but also connect us better than ever before. It's from here the debate turns to energy from waste facilities or waste incinerators. Build as a method of supporting a circular economy, at least on the face of it, uh, a proposal to use our waste as a valuable energy source might seem positive, but it is not news to anyone in this chamber that historically we have largely had a careless approach towards waste. Growing momentum for recycling and reuse initiatives stems from a modern awareness of the damage done to our planet and the dangers of climate change. And there's consensus that we need to be responsible users of our natural resources. And this means efficiently reducing our waste output where possible. However, the opposition to development of waste incineration suggests there's more to this story. From an environmental perspective, energy from waste facilities are promoted as sources of energy that can reduce our need for energy generated from fossil fuels. However, the extent to which they carry this renewable tag is suspect. Current rules require that any recycling is first sifted out, but these are only useful if robust enforcement is possible. Even if there are guarantees that waste will be separated in advance, uh, messaging is key. We cannot allow uh, public enthusiasm for recycling to wane by appealing to present um, incineration as an alternative. Facilities uh, emissions are also a key sticking point for local communities. Evidence may suggest that potential health effects for local residents are small, but there are a number of factors at play, many of which are key considerations for planning applications, and we've heard these already in the debate, uh, presiding officer, such as distance from local homes. A planning process that is incomprehensible and difficult to access will give little confidence to residents that their health fears are being adequately considered. And it's worth noting that current assurances rely on the European Pollution Prevention Regulations and the EU's Waste Incinerator Directive. And with Brexit looming ever closer on the horizon, it's imperative that these strict environmental controls from energy for waste uh, facilities are not eroded. Environmental initiatives are not there just to tick a box. Our efforts to improve the way we treat our environment are because we want to protect our nat natural assets and improve the well-being of Scottish citizens in the future. We should not lose sight of this. With such a contentious subject, the Scottish Government must continually ensure that incineration is efficient as expected and remains justified in balance. Equally, it's necessary that decision-making on energy and waste facilities need to be as well informed as possible. Difficult decisions are sometimes required, but it's crucial that communities are involved and listened to throughout the planning process. On issues like this, we need to remember our goal. If the planning system is to serve the communities of Scotland as we want, then it's not sufficient that the environmental friendly label is unquestionably used as an excuse to run roughshod over communities' genuine concerns. I want to thank Monica Lennon again on our initiative this evening, and I fully support her motion and her campaign on this issue. Thank you. I call Fulton McGregor to be followed by Margaret Mitchell. Thank you, President Officer, and I'd like to take this opportunity uh, to thank Monica Lennon for bringing forward uh, this debate. It's not going to be any surprise, I'm going to focus my comments on a situation that I've had much involvement with, the incinerator, pyrolysis plant, energy to waste unit, whatever you want to call it, at Carmen Bro and Coat Bridge, which has already been mentioned. And the historical facts of this case are what they are, and they've already been outlined by Elaine Smith, but suffice to say that the North Lancashire Council did um, reject the original proposal, but it was overturned um, on appeal at the reporter, and subsequent money was spent by North Lancashire Council um, taking it to court, but unfortunately uh, that was in vain as well. But beside officer, despite that, there is another fact that holds true. There is no incinerator up. And there's a variety of reasons for this, but in no small part down to the efforts and dedications of the campaign group Monklands Residents against Pyrolysis Plant, ably led by Maggie Proctor, who has also been mentioned by Elaine Smith. And one of Maggie's key messages when she speaks to people is to remind us that it's not just the Cobridge areas of Cambro, Sykeside, Shawhead that will be affected by such a development, but many others for miles around. And that leads me to thank all political parties and politicians across North Lanarkshire for joining me in placing objections with the Council, including local uh, neighbouring MSPs, Alex Neil, Richard Lyle and Claire Hockey, uh, Neil Gray MP, 
Labour and Conservative list MSPs for Central Scotland. And I think it would be remiss of me not to give a special mention to Elaine Smith, who, as my predecessor in the constituency, eh, fought this for a long time. When I got elected, it was all well known about the situation. I had family and friends, and Karen Brown Shaw Head, I knew about the 6,000 strong petition. But I felt that I had a duty also to test it out. So last summer I undertook a survey in the area most affected. Nearly 500 households responded, and I'm keen to stress that it was households. Many said on the survey returns that they had two, three, or four family members, so you can do the maths yourself, and it was done over a very short space of time. And, and all these people, almost uh, to an individual, said they had serious concerns about the plant being put up. Pulled together a community meeting following that with the developers, SEPA and the campaign group so people could raise their concerns. Hundreds packed into Carnbro Primary School and I don't think anyone could have left the meeting in any doubt what the local area thought of the new proposals the same way that they've always felt. And this allows, that getting this information allows me to come to forums like this my role as MSP and say with full confidence that the people do not want this of my constituency. And there's a variety of reasons for this. Health inequality is by far the most prominent. Cope Ridge is already an area with a high level of health problems, including asthma, COPD, lung disease and others. And I'm delighted that the Scottish Government has targeted Cope Bridge as one of the first LEZ zones after the major cities, especially since the road running through Whiflet, not much more than a stone throw away from the proposed development exceed the recommended amount of emissions regularly. People are literally worried that the chemicals involved will affect their health and that of their children. Uh, they're, also, they're also concerned that it makes it less attractive for housing, for people to bring up their families and put people off the area. This all at a time when I've sought assurances from the government that the new road networks around the M8 will bring economic benefit to the local area. What a shame then if all, the, all that's brought tangible is to feed waste down the A and off at the Cambro Junction. And the history of the area as well. Recycling plant had to actually be closed down by SEPA just at Shawhead. Again, a stone throw away from, the, um, from the, 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 the proposed plant. And I would have to mention community campaigners such as Kirsten Smith, who helped to bring that around. The group um, that Elaine Smith, I know, was a, a member of, will be set up again uh, following the public meeting I mentioned, but perhaps it's been overtaken by events. There's an application in place for which objections had to be in for the start of the month. Hundreds of applications, are in, hundreds of objections are in, including from the MSPs that I mentioned. This is to go before councillors. And this, there was a, this was an amendment to a previous application, which had to be withdrawn. However, it is worth saying that there have been questions raised about whether this should have been an amendment at all, as it's clearly a new major development, and therefore should have been subject to sections 35A and 35B of the Planning Act. And I have asked this question of the, of the, the government uh, and I await a response for that. Presiding officer, despite what opinion may be on the need and usefulness of incineration, and environmental incineration certainly leads me to a particular point of view, but despite this, I accept that there may need to be a wider argument to have. How many do we need? Where should they go if required at all? And how should local communities be involved in the planning process? These are all questions we must answer. What I do know is that this is not the right place, not in a heavily built up and populated area, not in an area where high levels of poverty and health inequality exist, not in an area where many of us are trying to actively regenerate, encourage expansion in, including exciting plans, for example, for the Monklands. Not in Cobridge. The people don't want it, and they've spoken time and time again. You must this close. government has taken on fracking for the good of the nation, taken on the whisky companies, and are currently fighting a be Brexit power grab. Cam Road doesn't want an incinerator, and if we all stick together, we can make this happen. I'm fully aware that the situation is with North Lancashire <laughs> Council. You and must nothing close. Nothing at all to do with the Minister, because I, I think this is important. However, I hope it's you know, Mr. Uh, it may well be important, but please close. OK, thank you, President. Officer. Thank you. You just blew it there, Mr McGregor, <laughs> that comment. <laughs> uh, Margaret Mitchell is the last speaker in this, and one of the reasons I have to be so quick is because we've actually run out of time. Uh, so to allow Margaret Mitchell to speak and indeed the Minister to respond, I'm minded to accept a motion under Rule 8.14.3 that we extend the debate to allow that to happen. May I invite Monica Lennon to move the motion? Moved. Thank you, Ms Lennon. Uh, are we all agreed? The debate is therefore extended. Thank you. Margaret Mitchell. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. I'm pleased to have the opportunity to speak in today's members' debate about incinerator, incinerators, public health and planning in Scotland. And I thank Monica Lennon for raising this important topic for debate. 
The Hamilton constituency office, which I share with my colleague Alison Harris, is located just along from the site of the former Craighead School on Whistleberry Road. Over the last few years, as we've heard, this land has been the subject of a planning application for the development of an energy recovery centre, which, as my uh, Mark uh, Rusco referred to, is commonly known as an incinerator. The first application was lodged by the developer Clean Power Properties in 2013, and this in turn triggered universal opposition from the local community and from the local authority, South Lanarkshire Council, which rejected the planning application in 2014. And thereafter, the application was referred to the Scottish Government reporter who found in favour of the developer in 2015. As a consequence, it's fair to say the local community and the thousands of individuals, including councillors and MSPs from all parties who had recorded their opposition to the incinerator, felt that their justifiable concerns had been merely swept aside. So rather than this decision being taken locally by those well-placed to assess the issues of concern, the decision-making was centralised. In 2017, the community was dealt another blow when clean power properties returned with plans for an even bigger facility. For example, as part of the planning application, the developer has applied for permission to build a 95-metre emission stack. For those who are familiar with Hamilton, this would result in the stack towering over the 60 metre high county buildings, which can be seen for miles around. And for the local community, this means quite simply, the bigger the plans, the greater the risks. As yet, the local authority has not taken a decision on this latest application. In the meantime, the local community's campaign of opposition continues with the support of organisations such as Hamilton Energy Recovery Action Group, Bothell Road Action Group, Hamilton Academicals Football Club and the Hamilton Advertiser. And elsewhere in Lanarkshire, the community faces a similar battle with Monklands Residents Against Paralysis Plant Group battling against incinerating planning applications in Canbrough since 2009. Paralysis and gasification is a new and developing technology which divides opinion. What is certain is there is little proof to, corrobor to corroborate claims on the performance, safety, potential environmental, uh, environmental effects and sustainability. But it is a fact that incinera the incineration process in whichever form produces acid gases, particulates, dioxins, airborne heavy metals and ash residues. Presiding officer, for all the reasons listed above, including the health and well-being of future generations, the local community's opposition to these new incinera incinerators must be heard and acted upon. As elected members, it is essential we continue to work together on a cross-party basis to support the local communities and the tremendous effort that they've put into campaigns to reject these incinerators as new te technology, the effects of which have not been tested and remain unknown. I now call Kevin Stewart to respond to the debate. Um, around seven minutes, please, Minister. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Presiding Officer, and I congratulate Monica Lennon in securing the debate today. Um, and we'd like to thank everyone for their contributions um, this afternoon. Um, as all in the chamber, I think, are aware, it's not appropriate for ministers to comment on the merits of any individual application uh, so as not to prejudice uh, the outcome of the decision-making process. So my response today will focus on planning policy, uh, and the improvements we're making to planning in Scotland, including through the Planning Bill, uh, which is currently before this Parliament. Uh, and I will also uh, touch upon some of the waste policies uh, which we have um, in the country. 
Um, Scotland um, needs new development and, and infrastructure to support a low-carbon econ economy. And we also need to work with communities so that this happens in a sustainable way. And our approach to waste and resource management focuses on the development of a more circular economy here in Scotland. Uh, and that means reducing leakage of valuable materials uh, from the economy. Uh, so we need to consume less, we need to reuse more, uh, we need to repair more, uh, and we need to recycle more to keep these materials in circulation for as long as possible. And that's why uh, the waste hierarchy is at the heart of our waste legislation and policy. The hierarchy states that first, uh, we should use or consume as little as possible. And if we absolutely have to consume a product, we should try to reuse it. An example of that is our proposed deposit return scheme uh, for drinks containers. And if we can't reuse, uh, we should repair it. And if we can't repair it, we should recycle the component parts of the product. I'll give way to Mr. Golden. Maurice Golden. Uh, I, I thank the, the member for taking an intervention. I, I wonder if we could focus on whether the 12-fold increase in incineration is compatible with the circular economy as the member so adeptly um, articulated. Kevin Stewart. Uh, thank you, uh, President Officer. Um, in 2015, um, mixed municipal waste, that's residual waste generated in Scotland, uh, was 1 million 982,396 tonnes. Uh, less than 6% of that was put to incineration here in Scotland, and that was all done at two existing plants, uh, presiding officer, in Dundee uh, and Shetland. Um, we've done a lot of work with uh, local authorities uh, to try to make it easier for people to separate their waste properly so that more can be recycled. And 26 councils have now sign, signed up to uh, the Household Recycling Charter. And what we all put in our, our, our residual waste bags, the general waste that we don't put in our recycling bins, is collected, then sorted to try and remove anything that can be recycled. But sometimes it simply isn't possible uh, to recycle materials, as folk are well aware. Uh, that might be due to the very high contamination levels or poor condition of the materials, or it might be because there aren't currently any processors capable of recycling that material. What's left, which inevitably includes some biodegradable material, presently in the main goes to, uh, to landfill. Uh, that will change in January 2021, uh, when a statutory ban on biodegradable waste to landfill in Scotland is introduced. Uh, therefore, this waste will move up the next step of the waste hierarchy, which is energy from waste. And that means we will need uh, some additional capacity. Uh, national planning policies, uh, of course, require planning authorities to prioritise development in line with that waste hierarchy. And it also states that strategic and local development plans should allocate sites for future waste facilities. I'll take Mr Simpson. Thank Graham you. Simpson. Thank you very much. Um, so just for clarity, um, you talk about um, extra capacity. Does, does that mean more incinerators? Kevin Stewart. That, that doesn't necessarily mean that, and I'm not going to get drawn on individual applications, as I've said, because that would uh, prejudice uh, myself in any future decision making. Uh, and I've already stated that we already have uh, two um, incinerators in op operation in Scotland at Dundee um, and in Shetland. Um, President officer, um, national planning policies uh, require planning authorities uh, to prioritise development, as I've said. And planning and regulation is needed to ensure uh, that communities and the environment are protected from the impacts of development. And we have a clear regulatory framework extending beyond planning to ensure that decisions on waste facilities are made on the basis of good evidence as well as on community views. Uh, it has to be very br briefly, Miss Lennon, and it's only because it's you, the mover of the, uh, the motion. 
I'm, I'm Monica flattered. <laughs> I'm flattered, presiding officer. I know the minister um, has to steer away from talking about individual applications and understand he's setting out an evidence-based approach. Given the minister's privacy, a lot of advice from officials and so on, could he allay the fears that our constituents have? Is he able to tell us, would he like to live within 100 metres or so of one of these incinerators? Because that's what's facing the people that we represent. I can allow you a wee bit extra time, but, Minister. But, You've been generous with interventions. Presiding, presiding officer, if I give an opinion about incinerators, that may prejudice any uh, future decision that I have to make. So I apologise to Miss Lennon, uh, but I am not going to uh, rise to that bait, um, uh, presiding officer. Uh, I have to be very fair in all that I do here. Um, members of the public would expect me to do that. And as uh, folk are well aware, the ministerial code has a special section uh, for the planning minister, uh, and I don't want to fall foul uh, of the ministerial code. Um, I, I'm sorry, I, I really can't, um, presiding officer. Um, presiding officer, I, I, I realise that we are now over time. Um, I have been very clear um, that uh, planning should be done with people uh, and not to people. Uh, and within our proposed planning bill, which is currently being scrutinised, uh, we have uh, opportunities to ensure that people become more involved right at the very beginning of the planning process to try and avoid uh, conflict at the end. That is what I want to see happen um, and I hope that uh, Parliament uh, will scrutinise and pass that bill uh, so we get to that position. Uh, I do encourage uh, much more folk to become involved in the planning system than currently is, and I hope that we get to that point. And I thank you very much uh, for uh, allowing me the additional time, presiding officer. That concludes the debate, and the meeting is closed.